Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Gossels, Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film, and I'm excited to be in conversation with Becky Tahel and film participant Rav Daniel Katz after the screening of Becky's amazing film, American Birthright. Becky, we've come to know you very well through your film, so this intro is gonna be super short for you. Um, you're an Israeli-born, LA-based creator of conscious content. Um, this film, American Birthright, is your first film, Mazel on that, your first feature-length doc. And you are a conscious content creator. You've produced content for countless brands worldwide and garnered over 40 million views across social media. Hi, Rav Daniel. Um, so- Hi, Lisa. <laughs> hi. <laughs> hi, Becky. Um, so good to hear. <laughs> so I just went on your website last night. It's called The Elevation Project. And I spent some time with you. And I actually spent time with you in a rock star. And I would say you're kind of a rock star in this Jewish meditation and Kabbalah and spirituality world and self-actualization world through Torah and Halakha and Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it really cool also that you started out as a filmmaker as here we are talking about film and Jewish spirituality. Mm. Um, so because we're gonna dive in a lot with Becky, do you wanna start, Rav Daniel, by telling us a little bit about the Elevation Project and then how you and Becky connected? Yeah. Well, I kind of feel Becky should say how we, how we connected. I mean, Becky, I just got an email one day. Is that by Becky? Is that how I met you? I Becky just you know, comes in like, yeah. like a force of nature with joy and charisma and curiosity. And I'm like, who is this woman? She wants to interview me for something. Had we met before that? We hadn't. I, I just had gotten off a plane, super jet lagged. Someone said there's this like Kabbalistic uh, meditation seminars being filmed. You got to go. And so I, you know, put something on and uh, stumbled at the door and fell into a seat. And it was just so powerful i remember thinking to myself like i have to get this guy in my film like i have to sit with wow. with rob daniel Katz because it was just like the work that you were doing felt like exactly what i was hoping to find in israel and mm. it was day mm. two and mostly because i felt like a lot of jewish spirituality and the depth that i knew existed like i just had a sticky sweet feeling existed somewhere i couldn't find in la in a deep, truthful way. And it was like, again, day two in Israel, I I find you. Well, I mean, that that's that's your the narrative from the film, right? I mean, we, we see, now I see, I don't know why we began our story because I've seen your film and I, I know your story goes back, but that's what you were getting on the plane for, was exactly. to find that deeper connection. I mean, this is about really Becky's voice and not mine, but I wasn't born up religious. I was brought up in Melbourne, Australia, and I was a theater director and a film director and, and all that kind of stuff. But like a lot of creative artists, I was very spiritually seeking and I had a very strong sense of a moral, a moral responsibility with my films and my art that we could make a deeper impact in the world. Um, and I was very into exploring spirituality and I, I was into Buddhism and Hinduism and feminism and lots of isms. And like many people, like the only one thing I wasn't interested in was Judaism because everyone knew that was just religious and dogmatic and boring, right? So it's not, this is not really my story, but I had a very deep spiritual awakening and I ended up learning for 20 years in, in Jerusalem. But really the voice that I felt that I wanted to embody as a teacher was, which is I think, exactly speaking to Becky and Lisa, what you said when you saw that some of the sessions last night online was that there is there's so much, so, so many Jews are so deeply spiritually seeking f through all paths and they don't really know the, the not because of their fault really, because of our religious people's fault, they don't know the true depth and transformative experiential parts of their own tradition. So that's really what I'm just excited about and I love meeting people that are excited about that and you know, Part of how we met Becky was just the, the interface on, on that kind of voice, that kind of, these kind of teachings that I think we're all kind of seeking. So that, that was a point of resonance and point of discussion um, that, that began my journey with her. But I've been watching her develop and watching the film. I mean, I just want to say I saw so many drafts of the, ver of the film on its way to birth. And I want to say publicly, all of them weren't nearly as close as good as the last one, which she put forward the last one. It really popped into something magical. And I was thrilled. I remember getting on WhatsApp and just going, wow, 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 with it, watching it again straight away. So I'm so proud of what she's created. I think it's very, very special. Thank you. Thank you. 
Can I just say quickly, and then I want to listen to you, Becky. First, I want to thank you for making um, a film. How long is your film? It's 60... 66 minutes. 66, yeah, 66 minutes. minutes. Thank you hour. for doing that. Thank you for making this length of a film mm. um, that I get more out of each time I see it. Mm. Um, there's just so much to this film and so much beauty. And, um, and I love that you're kind of inviting everybody, no matter where what path you're on with Judaism or spirituality or just finding purpose in life. You're inviting us all to take this journey with you in a very inclusive way. Um, that's something I really appreciated. And I'm sure that was part of your intent. It was, and, and like I, I mentioned often, my production partner is not Jewish. And that was a really important piece for me walking down this path of creating something that I didn't want to feel like Bible camp. I wanted it to um, reflect in some sense the tradition that I was learning about and wanting to properly represent in film, right? Like, what is Judaism? Why do we Jew? What is all of this? But also not, not have it feel so, like Rob Daniel said, dogmatic and didactic and like teachy and, and pushing it down your throat because that was also the only experience that I ever had of Judaism. And I knew there was something deeper. And once I experienced it, I came back home with 150 hours of footage, <laughs> which was its own existential crisis <laughs> and feeling very responsible to tell a tale and a story that tracked a journey that could inspire anyone Jewish and not Jewish to really just dig deeper and ask, why am I showing up in the world as whatever my checkbox is in the identity area? Why am I being more particularly a specific religion and what value is that adding to my life? And I feel like that is especially relevant now in the world where we are just, we're, we're just so lost. Like we're more lost than, I, than during the era that I was making um, this film in. Um, it's like post COVID, we are just so confused. There is no compass to truth. It is so hard to find true North. And so we are hungrier and thirstier for leaders. And I'm, and this is again why for the first time and i'm glad that you gave me the platform to have rob daniel and an, an expert like i'm an expert at being a non-expert i'm certainly not a person who's going to teach how you know we came to be as jews but i am so blessed to have access in relationships and connections to some of the best and what i will also say and i'll get off my soapbox after that is it took a long time to find these wonderful teachers. And I think one of the biggest pain points that Jews, and I'm sure non-Jews have, but I just only know the Jewish experience in this particular area, is that they meet a rabbi, doesn't resonate, and they go, meh, I'm not really into this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that happened to many people in my family. And I saw them write you know, Judaism off because of one rabbi. And that's yeah. so sad. So sad, yeah. I was raised um, in this amazing congregation, Congregation Bethel of the Sudbury River Valley in Sudbury, Mass. And Larry Kushner was our rabbi. And he's written many books. And his daughter, Noah Kushner, is a rock star. She's mm -hmm. in the at the kitchen. Um, I knew her when she was a kid, you know, in San Francisco. And I'm now part of Rabbi David Ingber's um, congregation, Ramam, is still in New oh, York wow. City, where I live my, you know, my entire career till COVID and this job. Um, and so I have to say, it took that long to find Romamu for me to find home again through Judaism. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time I joined a synagogue. I love the holidays. I would go obviously on the high holidays and often come home. But it wasn't until I found Romamu, which was like my spiritual home that I stream online now. And now I'm going to be streaming Ralph Daniel too, um, mm -hmm. that I was able to connect. So I really appreciate that. And I, and, I think and a dug. lot of people, yeah. But yeah. you dug. You did that I work. I, I most did people that. Don't. Most people don't. And I think that's that's also the thing to encourage is to say, like, we're on the other side. We're here. We found connection because we kept looking. It's like dating and dating one person and it not working out and saying, you know what? Screw this whole thing. It doesn't work that way. I, I want to I ask. Can I ask a question, Lisa? Can I throw a question at you both? That's exactly what this is about. Perfect. Awesome. So I'm getting my first brownie point for the evening. <laughs> I, I want to know why some people dig, right? Why do some people like, I mean, Lisa, you're telling us that you grew up in that environment. You grew up with high quality, more sensitive individuals in Jewish leadership. <laughs> Becky, maybe not so. I mean, there was some of that wasn't, I don't, I didn't even, I really feel like, you know, God or Torah came after me with a baseball bat. It was a nice, soft, sweet, 
you know, mind-blowing baseball bat. But there's so many spiritual seeking Jews today that gave up a long, long time ago. We all know the bad Sunday school experience, the bad terrible bar mitzvah experience of meaningless and empty. Yeah, I for sure had that as well. Um, but most, I don't know if we want to say most, today there's a whole group of people that that's enough and goodbye. And that, that wide open, sensitive, perceptive, spiritually seeking Jewish soul seems to give up very fast in its own tradition. And there's a few weird people like Becky who <laughs> still come knocking back at the door. They feel compelled to try again. Why keep looking after one bad rabbi experience? Why keep looking? I wonder if you could speak to what you think that calling is. I want to like terribly quote Ozark. I, and I'm in, I'm watching the show, um, mostly for market research. And in season two, it's like the pastor talks about how, um, and he really comes hard at one of the main characters for leaving tradition. She was like left Christianity because of whatever. And he goes, you didn't leave because you, you because of something or whatever yourself, you, you left because you never believed. You never actually believed to begin with. And I think for me, I always, and maybe it happened early on, and it's a wonderful question that I'll keep walking with to refine. I think early in my childhood, I deeply felt God. Like I deeply felt a personal connection with God and knew and had the embodied experience that there was something there, that there was a creator and there was a purpose for me in his creation. And with that being some interesting core sort of truth that I didn't have a lot of language around, I always walked with that knowledge. And so if, if you know, if some rabbi didn't speak my language, it was like, well, I, I, but I know, but I know this, but I know this. So let me find someone that does. Um, and I think I just always believed that there was something. Now, I will also mm -hmm. say it's not just a credit to me and some weird little feeling that I had as a kid. In my 20s in LA, I also connected to some really wonderful spiritual people who, who gave me some additional insights into the experience. Um, and while I'm no longer really affiliated with that group, I'm really grateful for the experiences that I did have because they solidified. It was like a doubling back. It was a great callback to my childhood where it was like, ah, oh, that feeling you had, there's practice and ritual that helps mm. solidify and deepen that. And mm. so I was like, ah, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Okay, so still not, still not my rabbi, but there's, I just know, like, I don't know. M maybe it is just I'm weird. I think I'm just so scared. it's interesting. It's, it's like it's like there's an inner GPS. It's not like there's an external religion, external voice telling me what to believe. It's right. I'm trying to find something that's that's going to resonate, call forth, or speak to something that's already very innate within me. I, I think that's something I, I I kind of feel like I don't connect to that, but I feel most people that I speak to do have connected to that on that Jewish journey. Not that I don't connect it in the fact that it was very hard for me to resonate with that as a Jewish voice. The calling mm. for spirituality was real, and but it took me a while to find the Jewish version of that. But I, I think that there's something very deep what you're speaking to. It's people seeking from the inside out rather than the outside in, so to speak. And I think that's how they often find their way home. Mm. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, in your film, you're asking all these big questions and, you know, and we hear a myriad, you know, range of answers. Not everybody's agreeing. And that's what makes this such an exciting film. And that's what actually, if you ask me about being Jewish, one of the things I love the most, I can come every day to whatever I'm doing, a prayer, a service, um, just life and request and again and, and, and find ways to reconnect again. Um, with whatever I've learned. So I really appreciate the multiplicity of views that we get in your film. And I also thought it really fascinating that, um, so we learned, so you were raised in Israel, you have a Holocaust background, your mom came from an Orthodox background and yet was culturally Jewish and that's how you were raised. Mm -hmm. And you had this real, it was very profound existential question about intermarriage, with your sister and Justin, sorry, yeah, your sister and Justin. Um, I love your relationship with Gal, about to be married and that whole journey. And then suddenly 19 minutes in, and we can talk about that, but you are into a bigger question. You know, what does it mean to be Jewish? And you don't go to a reform seminary in Israel. You go to, uh, you told me this on the phone, Haredi, uh, really orthodox. Jewish, you went for intense learning. Do you want to talk about that, like that, yeah. that progression of your learning? 
Yeah. And so, by the way, I'd love to do a four month sabbatical one day. I'm too new to this job, but what a, what a joy to take four months to study. Oh God. And I, I wish I could do it again. And it's like, it was just so, so unique. And I, I'm so blessed to have been able to have had the time to do that. Um, and I will also say when you mentioned the like plethora of different ways to, to do and how like that's so lovely and dynamic for me, that was really daunting and scary. I was like, well, why isn't there just one? Why is it that only med school students get a path? That's like, you do this, you graduate, you become a doctor. Like I already came into this as an artist. There's no clear cut path. And now Judaism's telling me, oh, you know what? There's many ways. And it, it actually ended up being a little bit more confusing. And you see one of those moments in the film where there's so many ways to be Jewish. And I get that that's, that's part of the master plan and it's this beautiful dynamic thing, but how confusing at the same <laughs> time, like how very confusing, which is why ultimately I, I kept coming back to Neve Yerushalayim and the, the, the Orthodox, and like I said, the Haredi Orthodox um, teaching environment because one thing that I had learned that was really new information to me was that before reform and conservative offshoots came to be, it, we were all either by the book Torah Jews or not Jewish at all. We were just some other religion. There wasn't like a, you know, th there was a this thing, which was really interesting to me. So I was like, that meant that all, that my great, great grandparents were all like Torah Jews. And so if that were the case, that that incentivized me to just at least learn what the book says um, because then I could, then I could pick my shade of Jew, but if I don't know what the book says, um, I just felt like I was starting somewhere without all of the information. Um, so that's why that incentivized me. And then I remember also being at Neve and being encouraged by others to go, go seek other seminaries, go sit at other places where there are men and women together, where there are different ways where you can learn Gemara, where there's access to other learning and I really appreciated that invitation and I did go and ultimately there was something again here is me from the inside out there was something that would keep telling me like you know you really you really resonate with that strong no nonsense really bold leadership of the teachers that you're learning under at Neve and I would keep going back and I think that just points to maybe my generation or again what was happening around me there was just no strong leadership like I wasn't seeing people in my field, in my life that were so strong in their opinions and those opinions mm -hmm. being so specific and so age old and, and connected to what I felt like my ancestors must have, how my ancestors must have walked. And that felt really romantic and really strong and really beautiful and really meaningful. Like I felt very deeply moved. I'd have moments where just out of nowhere, I'd become very emotional thinking about my family. And I never, I never had that before. I never had that in LA. So yeah, I just always kept coming back and I'm glad that I found my place. I'm not saying that everyone's going to go to a Haredi uh, <laughs> place to study and be like, yes, this is my vibe. Um, but for me, it was, and it helped me to find my course moving forward. You know, Becky and Rob Daniel, I, I neglected to say that Rob Daniel is joining us from Jerusalem right now. And oh, Becky, you were true. in Jerusalem. And is there something about this place, this yes. the place, the stone, the history? Do you want to talk about that? Both I of wanna, you? And I want to ask this also to Rob Daniel. So anytime I land in Israel, I just immediately get hit with two things. One, a lot of anxiety. So maybe we can speak to why that <laughs> always happens to me. I land in Israel and it's like, I guess there's like this fire element that's like connected to Jerusalem. And so there's a lot of, it, it feels like a pressure cooker. And I feel like I'm, I'm constantly seeing myself and everything's really challenging in like really specific ways, which um, I've shared many of those challenges with Rob Daniel on, on my, my path. And so there is absolutely something about Jerusalem for me, for my personal experience, that is the container for learning, the container for growth and the container for a lot of anxiety. But like, let me, I, Rav, Rav Katz, like, what, what is it? Like, what is that about Jerusalem? I mean, you live this, there. This is textbook, right? I mean, it's called the Holy City or the Holy Land. And besides <laughs> a nice name, I mean, every, every spiritual tradition in the world has the idea of, of that there's, uh, that space and place can embody consciousness, right? 
So mm -hmm. from a Kabbalistic mystical place, Jerusalem is the energetic center of the world. That means it's the place of the interface between the higher spiritual world of, of higher consciousness and revelation and, and the physical world. But every spiritual, play, every spiritual tradition, Hinduism has their places to go and is, Islam has their places to go, where they believe that there's an energetic power to that place and whether people believe that's only because of projection of beliefs or whether they believe if, if enough people come for enough generations to one place to a western wall or a square or a certain river that that it, it causes there's a kind of a transference of energy of the consciousness of the passion to that place and that that feeds back to you so for jews but really for three of the main world's religions we've poured our consciousness and our connection into this place from a kabbalistic place it's more than consciousness that we when we've gone to the western world when we've gone to the city of Sfat where the Kabbalists were. I find Sfat even more extraordinary. Hmm. Any one of the little spiritual sensitivity. Have you been to Sfat, Lisa? I think when I was 16 on a nifty tour or something. So oh, I have to you, go back. Can we get you back? We're going to make a yeah. birthright sequel and we're going to bring you back. <laughs> the three leave. of us will do a Shabbos at Sfat. Okay, my... Sfat is unbelievable. Okay. Like I teach meditation around the world. The best way to teach meditation in Sfat is just bring people to Sfat. And they're, they're blowing out of their body. Jews and non-Jews there. So hmm. I, having taught here for 20 years and lived here for 20 years, when Jews and people of all backgrounds get off the plane, it induces anxiety and it induces transcendence. Um, the Talmud says it, it gives us chachma, it gives us the land, gives us higher consciousness and it expands us. When it brings, gives us higher consciousness, it opens up our light and it gives us insight to who we are and who our people are and what our destiny is. And it brings up our anxiety. Why? Because those things are deeply aligned. The more we are aware of our greatness and our light, the more we, we, we are concerned. It brings up our fears and our traumas and our concerns. We are not living up to that truth. And therefore, it's a place of deep challenge. You know, the Jerusalem syndrome, when everyone starts thinking they're the, the Messiah, that happens to all of us because we're all tapping into the, the divine messianic potential, each of us in bodies. So it's a, a place that energetically, psychologically, historically brings up the depth of who we are. And if that's channeled in a, in a, in a power, if it's channeled in an unhealthy way, then it can really, you know, destabilize a person. But channeled in a powerful way, it is undoubtedly, I mean, it's called American birthright. There's a thing called Israel birthright. And, and, and there is a thing that happens when people come here. That's what happened to me. I didn't have any connection to my own heritage till my father brought me here when I was 24. And it, it turned everything inside out. And it wasn't the information. It was an internal shift in consciousness. And it, we all know, we all experience it. And I think it's so obvious in hindsight that Becky had to come here you know, that, that it's, it's it, it, when in America, she was asking questions, right? And questions are getting answers and maybe she likes them, maybe she doesn't, maybe the resident don't, but it's still on the level of intellectual, rational understanding. But when she hits the line like we all do and kisses something deeper here, then, then it goes deeper into the heart and higher into the soul and becomes a much more transcendent, transformative experience. That, whatever he said, that is exactly it. That's what, that's it. That's okay, everything. this is over. We're done, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. We can break well, out. Okay, and, top. Okay. Um, okay. But, okay, wait. I don't even know how much more time we have, but that was awesome. A couple Lisa's quickies. dancing. We yeah, made I'm Lisa dancing. dance. You made me <laughs> dance. And um, I even have a standing desk. I could be standing and dancing. Um, <laughs> so you said, Becky, gosh, let me just see. Um, so you were telling me on the phone the other day that this whole idea of going for four months to Jerusalem was like you were almost going through conversion. You know, you were starting at square one to learn about Judaism from square one, right? And so you were converting. Right, right. And then you said, because I have this wonderful list of quotes from your film, I feel like there's a little bit of inner resistance to letting go of who I think I am and making space for whom I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And I just want to throw in my favorite quote that you just have reminded me of, and then to listen to both of you. Joseph Campbell's my man. He's one of my, my gurus. Ooh, uh, me yeah? too. Okay. So you know the quote, Rav, Daniel, I'm going to say one of my favorites. We must be willing to get rid of the life we've had to have the life that is waiting for us. And sure. I feel like that is what you were saying, Becky, and it's a big part of your journey. And it's why I think everyone, religious, not religious, wherever you are on this path can like get into this film and i'm just would love to hear from both of you on that it's it's um it's really powerful and i think we all 
resonate with that, like that idea of there is a version of me that's not optimal and I want to make space for next level. We want to up level. All the influencers are about getting us to the next level. And But what what is that next level and what does that next level look like? And I was very concerned throughout my process of going through this filmic journey, but also a filmic journey, making a film, but also making my next level of myself, the next iteration of me, that it wasn't like the pop culture next level, that it wasn't um, superficial, that I was that I was unlearning the right things and learning and relearning and or just learning from the beginning stages of the, the right things. And that was difficult to figure out. And I think that is still confusing for many people is so great. OK, I know I'm not living my life optimally, but what needs to change and does it actually need to change or is it my mind telling me something? And I think that's that's just difficulty. It happens in relationships often. I remember having justified staying in relationships that weren't optimal because I felt like, well, I mean, maybe I'm just not working hard enough. Maybe it's me, maybe I'm the problem. And and that was the same with my relationship to God and Judaism is I felt like, well, I'm not a bad person. I'm not a great person yet. Like I'm, I, I know it could be better. I know I could be more learned. I know I could be showing up differently in the world. I know I'm probably not living up to my highest purpose, but I'm not a bad, I haven't killed anyone. So I was living in this sort of in-between. And I think that that's where Rob Daniel teaches to is, okay, so where, how do we find the true North? And is there true, like, is there truth? Um, and that was a very difficult first step. And that is where you see me struggle at minute 19 through 25 of like, okay, I'm feeling like maybe this movie isn't what I thought it was. It's begging me to ask deeper questions, but what is that question? Am I asking if Torah is truth? How do I find a real answer and trust that answer, trust that I'm not being brainwashed? And then if that answer is so, do I have to throw out everything and be a completely different person? And so those, those four months were like, it was conversion in a way, and it was a brainwashing in a way, um, but a, a washing out of all of these old sort of ideologies and isms and a clarifying. And I was very cautious to make sure that everything I did was aligned. And if I wasn't ready to do it, that I didn't do it. And I, and I, the reason I say that is because there could be somebody watching and there are many people who go through a spiritual journey and have an awakening and they throw out everything and they take on everything. And there's a danger to that because, um, I think we can, we can learn things too quickly and not in an integrated way. And then it doesn't really stick. And so I see that as well. I see people getting very excited. And then a couple of years later, nothing is integrated. Nothing's there anymore. And they don't really believe in it at all. They didn't really think it through. And I'm sure Rob Dino can speak to why that happens and how we can repair those tears. Because I now, in my, the work that I do now with this film, I'm very interested in helping repair the tears that happen when we don't get education or when we get, get education in a way that isn't as embodied and at our pace. Because there's also something that can happen there as well. Um, and, and I think that, we're, that that was for me the biggest concern is how do I learn and grow in the right direction and get to my next level? And it's it's also a reflection on my process as bringing up yet another question of sort of like, great, I got to the other side, but I see so many people that I was in class with who didn't and who didn't connect and who didn't find their way and who are very unhealthy or lost or still don't know what they want. And why does that happen? But Daniel, like what, maybe if you can- Wow. Well, there's, there's so much you're bringing up that I'd like to address and like got some very deep and complex themes, but I, I kind of just want to address the you on the journey because you approach this from the beginning in your own unique style, which is tremendously courageous and almost literally fearless. I, I know you express fear in the film, but having watched hundreds go through this journey and, and been through it myself and all my close friends, um, I, I think what they're seeing in you now is what you had from the beginning, which is a tremendous self-confidence, a deep sense, a deep self-awareness, a very grounded curiosity. Um, and when people are coming from an unhealthy place of fear of lack of self-confidence and they grasp onto religion to fill those things, then often what they get is a religion full of low self-esteem and not knowing oneself, etc. When people come from a healthier place, they can connect in a healthier way. 
um, and listening to you and my, my concern with you from day one, which you did capture a line of me talking about it, kind of being a little meta with you during the film was, was, which are you using the film as a crutch? Is your confidence coming from the security that after you ask all these complex questions, I can say, cut, that's a wonderful take. Thank you so much, Rabbi Katz. Go, go to the next one. And then go back to the LA life. And my concern, and I, I spoke to you about that all the way through and after, um, it's like, is that what you're doing? Is the source of your confidence that you're not really investing truly your heart in the process? Wow. And I, I think that while that was my concern a lot of the way through, the truth was, that rather than filmmaking being a crutch, filmmaking was actually a tool, a resource that allowed you to explore yourself in a way of confidence, in a way of strengthening your own voice yeah. and, and watching your, and being met aware of your own process, but authentically really, really engaging. And I think because the process was so real and authentic for you and you use the, the filmmaking as almost like a journaling tool, I think you came in with strength and then you left with strength. And I think going back to Lisa's original question, to come close to anything, God or ourselves or in another in a significant other in a relationship, we have to lose a little of that ego self, a lot of that ego self to be authentically connected in a deeper way. Um, and if we do that in a healthy way, then we end up knowing the other, knowing ourselves more. And if we do that in an unhealthy way in a relationship that's called codependence and in religion that creates all the destructive form of religion or Judaism in the world. And, and I, I think that Becky just has a gift of confidence and self-knowledge and open curiosity and a real, there's not a kind of fear. There's, there's things that sometimes with any student you have to be always saying, are they able to hear this? Will this be overwhelming for them? Will this bring up that fear and doubt? I don't remember one time Becky having that. If you mm -hmm. said something deep or confronting, she's like, well, that's a really good question. I have to, I have to think about <laughs> that. And that allowed, I, I think you see that in, in the journey, in, in the film, is that she's, she's grabbing the bulls by her horn. She's being real with the process and real with herself. And I think that's the process that brings tremendous blessing. Mm, thank you. You know, as a filmmaker watching your film, um, and you alluded to this earlier, what an awesome responsibility making any film is. Okay, now speaking to two filmmakers, right? What an, and anybody listening, like what an awesome responsibility it is. And you did not tackle a light, easy question or issue at all. And how to go from 150 hours of footage in Israel and all the rest to do this and for it to be so authentic and to invite us all on your journey is like an amazing feat. Um, and it's also entertaining um, to all, you know, I liked it so much even more the second time and I'll like it even more the third time because there's just so much to get out of it and to notice and discover. Um, because I, I wish we were in conversation together in a movie theater, um, but because we don't have endless time here, let me just like leave you with the final kind of questions. And then I want to make sure how can we all connect or how can people interested in connecting with you do that? Um, so Becky, you kind of started alluding to like your goals with the film. I mean, I'm interested to know what do you want to do with this film or what are the questions you're hearing the most? And then Rob Daniel, I'm going to be curious, like, are you hearing some of the same questions? Are there any parallels between your work, you know, because you're teaching too. So let's go with that. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, it's there's no it's no surprise that I think media <clears throat> and film particularly are it, it just is a tremendous tool to take an audience through change in a really subtle, unassuming way. So there's one way where you teach and speak at a person, and then there's another way where you reflect to them a journey that somebody else is going on and say, oh, look, oh, how interesting that that person is doing that. Is there anything that you feel in relationship to that? And then they can sort of intrinsically come to the desire to maybe change or grow or want to learn. And um, my, my mother is a Jewish educator, so I grew up with education and academia being championed. And so I always wanted to make edutaining content. Edutaining, meaning that it's educational, entertaining, and all of it sort of takes you from up where you are and you end up somewhere else at the end and it, it's moving. And I remember feeling that way when I left the theater after watching Free Willy and just like wanting a whale. It's like, you know, we want to kick like the karate kid after we watch the film and that's the power of film. Like that, that, that is a truth. And so my concern now is how, how do I take this film 
and continue its life. It's like I've just birthed this child after carrying it for six years and I want it to have a life and I don't want to dictate what that life is supposed to be. So I'm watching and, and listening to sort of like what the times are begging for. And I've been touring it to on, you know, on campus groups and to different high schools and to different synagogues. And I, it's mostly been in the Jewish world. And I'm also interested to take it into the non-Jewish world to continue to, again, the whole point of like, why are we here and why do we do the work that we do to continue to, to elevate people, to have them think deeply, to up-level themselves and to live more meaningful lives. Like that's when, when somebody watches a film and comes to me after and says, I'm no longer afraid of Judaism. I'm like, wow, I did not know starting out that that would be the result of someone in that figurative audience that I was fighting to make this movie for all along. And that's very moving. And that goes back to that little girl who heard God and knew that there was a purpose. And I go, well, could this be my purpose? Could this be a piece of that purpose? So yes, I, you know, nuts and bolts, am touring this film and creating um, more uh, Jewish narrative uh, film and content that, that creates dialogue around topics that we're not really exploring in the media. I mean, what we see, and we can talk about this, and we already know that, you know, the stuff that we see on Netflix is very, very niche and tropey, and um, it's just not the breadth and, and depth of Judaism that I'd like to see represented in the media. And so I'm fighting to do that work along with some other really wonderful warriors that are doing that in the Jewish space to tell the stories that are untold in dynamic, holistic, and cinematic, beautiful, captivating ways. Um, and, but mostly to finish the work that American Birthright started and really inspire, starting with the Jewish people and then really the rest of the world, all of us to engage with the deeper questions. I think, again, walking with questions is the most just, it, it is brave, but it's also the most dynamic thing a person can choose to do in their life. Because if you're not with question, you're sort of not creating a vessel for anything. You're just, you're, it's, it's robotic living. And it breaks my heart to see people doing that day in and day out and saying, well, I don't know why I'm just unhappy. Just said, this is my, the curse of being human. And I don't think it's a curse to be here. I think it's a blessing and film can be a wonderful tool to illuminate just how blessed this journey can be. So that's my hope. Wow, thank you, Becky. Um, we'll have Daniel. Well, I just wanna say Becky's awesome, isn't she? I just love everything <laughs> what you said. I'd like to have that written and signed by you if I can. Um, I think Be Becky and I have a very um, deep kind of soul resonance on everything that she just said. You know, when I look at America today, today in the proverbial sense, and today as in literally reading the, the train wreck of what's happening on social media right now, you know, what I see is unbelievably polarized group of people on an unprecedented level. And besides every separate political issue, in, until this group of people can learn to start listening to each other and hearing each other and hearing truth in each side and realizing there's, there is some truth and goodness from people on both sides, then, then no single point will be resolved and things will only devolve. And, and I think that polar, polarization um, really is, is very similar to what you see in the Jewish world today between a very, very secular Jewish America um, whoever puts themselves in that box, I don't know. And very super ultra orthodox, Haredi, crazy, insane, dogmatic people like myself. Um, <laughs> and, and and I think that having been, you know, what's this term, whatever this term means, a Baal a person that wasn't born religious or Torah observer, and then becoming that, I, I think we are the perhaps the best best bridge builders between those worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and short of the dogma, you know, there's so much beauty and depth and richness and profound insight and wisdom, which is unprecedented in so many traditions that we can contribute. And I just think it's tragic being in my little Haredi bubble in Jerusalem, seeing so many beautiful things and seeing that I wish the Jews on that side of the fence, wherever they are, whatever this and that side is, I wish we could build bridges to share some of that wisdom and to share some of our journey together. Um, and you know that's what really motivates me in elevation. Elevation was just I, I see so many people seeking spirituality, or really seeking transformation and meditation, and and those things. And, and could could we take 
the deepest wisdom on human consciousness and psychology and meditation and, and spiritual experience and could we consolidate them into a system that we could teach and make a global contribution. That idea that Haredim with their incredible knowledge of Torah could make a global transformation and a global contribution, right, is from the Torah itself. We're supposed to be a light to the world. Um, and I think that's kind of got lost along the way in a couple thousand years of expulsions and, and holocausts and, and, you know, all these kind of things. So I'm kind of like Becky. I think we're the souls of the bridge builders and we understand and appreciate a beauty and value in each side. Um, and, you know, we're looking to build those bridges. That's why I'm honored to be here for 15 minutes with you both and do that. It speaks to the depth of, of who we are and hearing the, the wisdom and contribution for both sides. And it's one of the things I have to say that I, I really was most blown away by, by the film and the last version of the film, because until the last version, Becky hadn't cracked this. And I remember sending her a message mm -hmm. when I watched, I don't know, the 50th uh, iteration, <laughs> and I thought it wasn't quite there. And I, I kind of said to her like the same line I was pushing her from the beginning, like at the end of the day, she went to find out whether intermarriage is an okay thing or not an okay thing. And knowing Becky's process, the punchline for Becky personally was, it's not a good thing. She really felt that she wanted to marry Jewish because ultimately she feels that's the truth. So then I said to Becky, who's this film for? Mm. Because if this film is for religious people, they're so glad that you said at the end, don't intermarry. <laughs> and if this is for a greater America, they don't want to hear that message at the end of the day. So they're going to, you know, throw out the baby with the baby. They okay. may enjoy the hour version, right? But they're going to say, oh, at the end of the day, she got brainwashed. So I was like, how do you speak your truth, what you found in the journey? Mm but still not alienate and, and reject and belittle every other approach. And I kind of feel that's the miracle of the film. I was saying, like, I don't know how you're gonna do that. I remember giving her some ideas, but they weren't the right ideas. And then she went off into her bubble and she kind of came back and said, well, I'm not, but not because of me, just because of how she was putting it together. And I feel like that's the perfect thing. You know, she really said, this is what I found. I respect my journey and I expect what I found and I respect their journey that they're on. And, and I think it's, that's a voice where wisdom can be bridged. It's mm -hmm. a voice of, of deep, authentic, personal experience, which gives clarity and truth and simultaneously listening and respecting and appreciating the journey of others. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, I think she's done something very special now. And now these dialogues can take place. And you know, I salute her for that. And you know, I, I want to go in that path as well. And I think that's what we're all striving to do. And if, if we can take down some of the, that polarization through this dialogue. I think that there are, are really untapped well wellsprings in our own tradition, which I think so many Jews today would just be blown away to know that was part of their path. And that's just what we're trying to bring to the table in the most sensitive and compassionate way possible. Um, yeah. You are both remarkable. And I love that we're ending this conversation on this sense of wholeness and unity and coming together and bridging differences in this very polarized world. And Becky, at the end of your film, when you said what it means to be Jewy, it's like one of your talks that you do. I was really in tears listening for the second time. And you talked also about being an eternal flame. And I think in Buddhism, you know, namaste, we're bowing to the light in each other. This is very universal stuff. Mm -hmm. If we can all be that light um, for each other. And one of my favorite metaphors in the film was about the oil and vinegar. I think one rabbi said, oil and vinegar to intermarry. And I love what your sister said. And you said, you know, and I'm all for this, like this blending can be even better. Um, and I embrace all the different points of view in your film. And I just want to thank you both. This has been extraordinary. Um, before we go, Rob Daniel, are you coming to the Boston area or New York City? How can we meet in person? How can we get yes. people from Boston Jewish Film or other communities? I refuse to come until Becky you come too. to SWAT. You have oh, to come to SWAT first and then I'll come to okay. Boston. Let's so do my, it. My goal uh, my, is- My wife is from Boston, Lisa, so that, that's your hook in. Okay, wait. There you go, the hands are in the everything. air. Okay, hold, we, we're talking after. We're ending with Jewish diography, fine. Oh my God. I'm, I'm always thrilled to come. I haven't been there for a while for all kinds of technical reasons. I usually spend a lot of time in America. I haven't been to Boston for a while. I'd be thrilled to come. Let's set something up and we'll make it happen. Jeez. And Becky, you too, and- I'll fly in. I'm hoping to be at the Jerusalem Film Festival next year. Um, okay. And maybe you're invited for Shabbos. You'll come join us. Oh my gosh, us. thank and you. And you should. There's yeah, no one else me, I go. I will do that. <laughs> and um, anyway, to be continued. So elevationproject.com, is that it? Mm -hmm. And Becky, what's your website, please? AmericanFirstRightFilm.com. Okay, great. 
Thank yeah. you um, Thank so you. much for this amazing conversation and to all who are listening. This was wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Becky. Thanks. Thank you.